It's now time for On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson. The conversation will range from local dialogue to international. This show is meant to enlighten, inform, and to inspire. On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson begins now. Hello, welcome to On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson. It is a beautiful Sunday morning, and no matter where you are, whether the sun is shining or not, it is a beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you all for joining us. As usual, another interesting person to talk to today. It's the best part of my Sunday talking to different people from all around the world. The young man today, he is a poet, published by the way, (laughs) recording artist, producer, teacher of composition, world and British literature. The list goes on and on. He's founded companies, publishing companies from Chesapeake, Virginia, known throughout the world. We say hello to Seneca Lofton. How are you? Hey, sure. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. I, I greatly appreciate it. Not a problem at all. How do you find time to do all these things that you're doing and come on the campus of, of Norfolk State and teach these students? Where do you do you have some time that the rest of us don't have? Right. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like, I guess you get you, once you, you know, when you love something, when you love doing something, you know, the, the writing and, and the publishing and the teaching, it's like it becomes like a um, it becomes a culture. It becomes a culture and, or a labor of love. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so um, I have to really plan out my activities and where I have to be, you know, um, is in person, is it online. Um, and I find that if I can plan it out, you know, for the most part, I can kind of get things done. Um, uh, and, and as long as, like, there's, like, a, a blueprint in place, um, I'm able to get things done the way I want to get things done. Um, and sometimes some things fall through, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I have to kind of absorb that and accept that. But for the most part, yeah, if I can, you know, get my writing done, I get it done early. I, I start real early in the morning, like, you know, 5, 5.30, I'm in the gym. I get my, my workouts and stuff done. Um, I get my writing done before I even, like, you know, get into the car to head out for my day. So once I get that stuff done, the mm-hmm. rest of the day is kind of like downhill. That is amazing. So take us back to as early as you want to take us and give us uh-huh. your background because I'm trying to figure out where this love of word and song and poetry, I'm trying to figure out where all that came from. So what's the background? Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. I grew up I grew up in Southern California, uh, Long Beach. I went to elementary school and junior high in Long Beach and, and high school in San Diego. But in Long Beach, uh, fourth grade, uh, my fourth grade teacher used to always read Shel Silverstein's books, um, poetry and illustration. And I fell in love with that stuff. In class? Um, that, so okay. In, in class, he would set aside time, usually towards the end of the day, like 30 minutes or so, and he would just read and show us the pictures. And, and um, that's when I really fell in love with the sound of poetry. You know, I didn't start writing it. I didn't start writing it maybe like fifth grade. I really started getting into writing it. Um, and kind of did it off and on all through school, you know, middle, all through high school. Um, and then once you get to high school, it's like, okay, what are your career options? You know, what do you want to do after this thing? Um, and, it, it, you know, is college, is the military, is it working? You know, um, I was like, well, I want to go to college, but I don't want to know. I don't know what I want to major in. And, and mm-hmm. my counselors there were like, hey, what are you good at? You know, you know, I can I can write, and I like writing, and I played basketball. I was a jock, kind of a jock. But at that point, I wasn't really looking to, to pursue it in college. I wanted to do something else. Um, and so, uh, by the time I left high school, my plan was to to uh, continue writing um, and and figure out like what the other what other published poets what were they doing? What were their careers? Um, and so that's when you know I started to, to thumb around that that poets and writers magazine. And I saw that you could major in creative writing and, and these poets, they're teaching and they, you know, they were getting their teaching credentials. You know, one of my favorite poets is Nikki Giovanni, who's at Virginia Tech. Um, Tim Siegel, who's just, Tug life. uh, retired. <laughs> yeah. Tim Tug Siegel from ODU. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are my, 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 uh, my mentors, um, and, and so I thought, okay, let me get these teaching credentials, okay? That means I got to go get this bachelor's, this bachelor's degree. I got to do right. all this stuff. So I um, went to get the bachelor's. I went to, um, ended up going to Vermont. Uh, there was a school in Poets and Writers called um, Goddard College. There was two of them, Goddard College and Antioch. Antioch is in Ohio. Goddard College is in Vermont. And for me, they're both out in the sticks. So I'm like, well, I'm not familiar with either one. So 
let me go here. And, you know, I went to like a um um a Discover Gotter Day where you get to like meet and greet, and you get the the the, the red carpet treatment for like a few days. You know, prospective students. Uh, so I went out there, hung out, and and loved it. Uh, saw that there were like you know some African American folks and Black folks that were there, and had went there. I was like, okay, I'm sold. So you know, I go in there and I get my little my little bachelor's, my bachelor's of arts degree in creative writing. Um, and I was like, you know, maybe I want to teach college. You may want to, you know, I want to have that open. Um, and so I went and got the master's degree from the same school. Um, and then after that, it was it was pretty much um, uh, I was told like a lot by a lot of people, a lot of posts that I knew at the time. They're like, well, focus on your writing, focus on your teaching chops. You know, get in the classroom. Um, get all, get all that. And then, you know, you'll be right on that path you need to be on. And so from that moment on, um, that's kind of the, the, the road that, that I've been on, you know, writing, constantly publishing, staying in the classroom. And like I said, I've created like this, this kind of like ecosystem for myself and that, that's worked out. When you were a young boy beginning to love the word, the spoken word, the words, the literature, what was the reaction from your family? Oh, really? Cool. It was like, well, when I first started writing, they were kind of like, well, yeah, he, he's writing. It, it, well, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of like a hobby. They see it as a hobby. They see that I'm kind of good at it. And they, and they started to see that um, I was publishing stuff. I was publishing stuff. I was getting into local papers. Mm-hmm. And they saw something was there. And my parents, they're from Mississippi. You know, they're, okay. they're down home. Yeah, Mississippi. Like a lot of black folks, you know, most of our four parents and ancestors came out of the American South uh, for the most part. But yeah, they're from Mississippi. And, and I remember, I, I vaguely remember my, like um, my aunt saying something like, well, what side of the family did he get that from? Yeah, because <laughs> I'm I, telling you, it comes, I remember watching, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I remember watching uh-huh. Chris Rock on finding your roots when he found right. out that, great great grandfather or somebody like that was a preacher and it just clicked in my mind to me that made sense about how he was where he was today so i agree with your aunt where where did this come from you know yeah where what's out of the family he did this from and my dad was like well i used to write back in the day and like yeah, it's kind of interesting how we like we, we delve into the family lineage when someone has a talent or skill it, it came from somewhere it came down somebody's yes. line <laughs> To get here, but um, but, but a lot of my um, my my relatives and cousins and uncles and, and aunts, a lot of them are, are are preachers. They're uh they're they're war veterans. I got a few Panther, Black Panther member family member, members from back in the sixties. They're so they're all about teachers. They're everything. Um, and so I, that's kind of, it's kind of like you know I'm 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 still in that tradition of you know the oral tradition like along the lines with them, but instead of Maybe me, me get into a pulpit, you know, I get behind a podium and I deliver like yes. poems for the for the most part, you know. You do um, that, and, and you, so, you're award winning at that, I might add. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. I've been lucky, you know, all of that. And and I figure, I figure out as long as I commit to the work and commit to the craft, a lot of the um, the accolades will come. Um, and that's kind of how it's been, you know, the the awards, the publications. It's just, it, I feel like it's just part of the, the, the life of a writer or a poet. And, and not to say you have to have those things to be considered a quality writer or a quality poet, but, it, but it's cool to, to look back and say, yeah, I did, I did achieve that and, and, and be humble about it, you know? That's right. That's right. So tell me this. I asked you earlier, but you've written 30 books, 30 30? Yeah. And you're yeah, teaching 30. and you're doing all this other stuff. And where do the ideas for these books come from? Pretty much like I, I write like um, I'm a topical writer. So I can really pull stuff just, just out of the headlines to go forth, go forth with um, a lot of times. And sometimes I have to break away from like the, the typical, like you can, you can always turn on CNN or MSNBC and find a news headline that, that it, that inflames you and, and, and get you going. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what gets my, that, that kind of writing uh, uh, accomplished for me. Uh, but sometimes I have to break away and, and talk about other things like, you know, love and relationships and raising a child and being married and, and, and things like, uh, things like that. And so when I get in the morning, that I need to go to my journal and uh, I, you know, and I just start, I start, started writing. Um, and sometimes I get a great poem. Sometimes it takes me four or five poems in a week to get something really good, uh, for the most part. But I find, I, I find a love in the practice of, of the writing 
Um, and and from that point, I was like, how do I got to I got to make sure I get this to people? You know, I, I want to I want an audience. Um, as well, because I'm a public poet, you know, there are a lot of private poets who just write for themselves and, you know, they don't want anybody to read their work. I was like, me, I'm trying to make a living, you know, do what I'm doing. So <laughs> in order to make a living, you gotta, you gotta start analyzing the business aspect of, of the publishing world and, and where you, where you can make, you know, uh, somebody doing, uh, the writing. But I find it like the inspiration, um, usually comes from, you know, circumstances around me when, you know, whatever's going on socially or, or politically, um, I can always bring into uh, my writing, but the hardest part is really breaking out of that theme of always um, staying with like you know politics and, and social economics and, and and the African American journey um, and breaking away and and writing about nature, writing about you know relationships, writing about you know some other things. Um, but that's kind of like how I've developed, you know myself and my craft and but you know the and the other harder part is just you know making sure that i'm publishing frequently enough to kind of keep that that uh the audience engaged and, and looking for what i'm doing next can you look at a child a student in your classroom and see that they have some of what you have in you and them, and it needs to come out? And if so, how do you bring it out of them? How do you go about exposing that or having them realize right. that greatness within them? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. First, you know, I, I never, um, I, I definitely recognize when they send stuff in and I see that they're exploring the page, especially with poetry, you know, it's, it's exploring the page, they're, they're, uh, they're putting the, the, the terms that they use amongst their peers in their poems um, and they're being experimental. That's what I know a kid is really interested in and, and really has some, but I, I never tried to like, um, like call them out. You know, I, I, I want to put, the, I don't want to put the spotlight on them to the point where they're kind of embarrassed. Like, Oh, he's, you know, I always try to say a lot of positive things um, privately and let them know, like, listen, you have, you have uh, a, a, a skill for this. You have a talent for this. You know, keep moving the way you know you're moving. So I keep I keep trying to encourage them, you know, to try new things and and to try writing for you know writing in different themes. But as soon as you know, I see that child has talent, has skill in this, I I continue to push. I, you know, I, uh, you know, not not aggressively, but you know, I'll push with like some other assignments and and ask and just kind of do like a survey. You know, what do you think about you know performing in public or reading your poems for your peers and it kind of starts there in the classroom like you know would you like me to read your poem would you like me to read your poem for you to the class or would you not like because some some writers they're not you know they're not they don't want they do it for the grade and they're in the class but they don't want their peers <laughs> to hear you know what, what they're writing so oh, really? it's all about yeah yeah it, it's, it's like that sometimes um but most times like dealing with like you know college students They'll, they'll, they'll just, they, they want the microphone. They want to be heard, you know, and they'll jump out there and they'll, they'll, uh, uh recite their poem. Um, some students are, are a little, little shy about it and, and, it, and it's fine. You know, it takes like, um, sometimes it takes a few classes of seeing their peers do it. Mm -hmm. You know, see their peers okay. do it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he can do it. I can do it. You know, right. Oh, right. He, he never, you know, he, he, he never, you know, uh, engaged, but like he likes this. He's into this. You know, maybe I can. So it becomes like a um like an infectious type of of thing where you know they see their peers do it and they're interested in doing it and they see the excitement of their peers when when uh, a a poet reads something and it's all accepted or you know they clap or they snap or or that's right you know the interaction is is there and they want that for themselves. What is the biggest compliment you've gotten from a student about how you have helped that student? Um, the biggest, I think, the biggest compliment I think I've I've ever received um, from a student is is I think one student uh, at one point told me that you know they they appreciated like the fact that you know um, that that I, I could give them like kind of like the tools to to succeed and to to actually get up there and perform poetry and perform writing and be you know right there with all the other poets you know from from yesterday, you know, and it's all about the, you know, the confidence. So they appreciate the fact that I instill confidence in them to do it. And I was like, really, that's all you really need. You have, 
the confidence, you have the experiences. You've experienced stuff like everybody else has experienced stuff, mm-hmm. right? Your stories matter just as everybody else's stories matter. And if you can write a complete sentence, which all of you can do, right? You can do this poetry thing. You know, I can give you the tools and, and, and I'm just giving you the tools and the basics. Now, what you do with it, it, do with them is all up to you because there have been poets all over the world that don't use grammar the same way. They don't use yes. the page the same way. They don't rhyme, right? But they've been considered great. And so, um, so some of the students I know um, have, have talked to me about, like, you know, thanking me for, like, giving them the confidence to say that their voice matters and that they can actually get up there and do uh, do some poems, recite some poems, and, and uh, be able to kind of connect with other, you know, people who like poetry or might not like poetry. Um, but writing is so subjective. It's so, you know, you're doing it in isolation, right? Um, and it's personal. And a lot yeah. of times poets don't want their personal feelings, you know, out there. But I try to be the one that's vulnerable in the beginning of a class. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll come from a vulnerable space and say, hey, this poem is about my wife's breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Or this poem is about, you know, my Aunt Mary passing away and like. So if I'm vulnerable and honest and, and naked in my emotions, they see that. They're like, wait, wait a minute. He can, he's doing okay. And this is the prof. This is, this is the instructor giving us, like, them, you know, they, that instills in them a confidence, that, you know, to do it as well. Speaking with Seneca Lofton, he's a poet, he's an author, he's an educator. Let me ask you this. Are rappers poets? A or, rapper? Yeah, well, or I, some I, of them, I dabble. I, not all of them or what? I, I, I play with a little bit of hip hop, you know, but I don't really like, I don't have, it's, it's really interesting because like my uh, hip hop, um, every verse you hear in hip hop is, is about 16 bars. So like 16 lines um, and it has a rhyme scheme, you know, there's a, there's a pattern to it. Um, my, I don't, there's something about that form that doesn't like for me, um, you know, I've been writing free verse poetry forever um, and writing that way it, it definitely takes um, a lot of time um, um, to do. It's, it's kind of cool when you when you get something, um, but I feel like the form doesn't really fit what I want to do all the time. So me, when when you hear me on a song of some sort, you'll hear me like on the chorus or the hook. Okay, that's like four bars, four <laughs> four bars, four lines. Four, you know, I don't have the attention span, you know, for, for a lot of bars like that. But I have my friends who are very like lyrical. They like the sixteen bar format. It's it's kind of interesting um, that way, but I like music. I like but, music, and so, like, you know, it, it works that way, I guess. But you would say that rappers are indeed, they are poets? Okay, so that's a billion-dollar question. So, uh, so <laughs> technically, technically, they're using the skill sets of poets, even if they don't know they're doing it. You know, even if they don't do it, like, they're, they're writing, uh, they're writing verses. They're writing verses. Um, they might not be always the best verses, but they're writing verses. They're in there, and they use stuff like um, similes. They use metaphors. They use figurative language and uh, these really cool abstract concepts. Um, but a lot of them don't know they're 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 doing it. You know, they just they they picked up on the tradition from mm-hmm. listening to other rappers do it. Um, but there are a lot of rappers you could read on the page. People like like Common and and, and Black Thought. Kendrick Lamar, some of Kendrick Lamar's work you can read on the page and yes, have it yes. take value from, you know, one of his albums won like a, you know, a, 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 a literature prize. I mean, it, it was, it's amazing um, to see that. But yeah, technically they use the skill sets um, of poets. I think Maya Angelou used, used to say, yeah, rap is just really poetry kind of sped up. It's kind of like just Paul Dunbar just kind of sped up a little bit. Um, and I've seen rappers do, I, I know it's one rapper educator, um, he's from the UK, and he he literally he rapped like Shakespeare lines with like hip hop music, and it all fell into beat based on. I mean, he's just rapping these poems, and they're all just Shakespeare words and Shakespeare lines, and yeah. So the 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 pattern is is always there, and a lot of rappers, you know, they they fashion themselves as 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 poets. Um, I I think you know those who who know they're using the, those kind of like uh, uh, skills. Uh, and techniques, you know, with the right. uh, the poetry, uh, with the music. But um, some rappers do it well, some don't do it as well, you know. Well, let me <laughs> but, ask you know, you that's, this. that's the nature of the music. Well, likewise, do you think the elders, as they're sitting there beating on the drums, was that poetry? Was Is that a form of poetry, you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the predecessor 
the predecessor of like hip hop is is are you know are people like Bill Scott Harris, you know, um, you know from the '60s, you know, reciting poetry to drums, you know, and, and we all know like where that comes from in our community. You mm-hmm. know, we can go all the way back to West African oral tradition with you know the oral bards and the storytellers and the keepers of the history. Um, you know, banging on the drums and, 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 or talking, preaching, telling a story, telling some history, saying a poem, you know, all of that, you know, it, it comes from those roots, you know, um, hip hop comes from those roots. Poetry comes from the, from, uh, from those roots, you know, as, as well. So, um, it's always like a tip of the hat, you know, yes, uh, yes. to the, to the ancestors when, you know, um, especially when I write poetry, like I know. I'm I'm standing on the shoulders of people, so I got to make sure I represent the right way. And uh, so, just to be clear, let me get make sure I have the right total. How many books have you written thus far? Oh, okay, yeah, uh, thirty, yeah, thirty books, maybe more. Like thirty, thirty is the last time I counted because I got this um this really cool, um, you know, way of writing, and, and it's 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 constant. It's a constant thing. And during when COVID really started to like take hold and, and we were in this kind of new normal, I was like, man, how do I like, you know, how do I expand my readership? You know, how do I like, cause I'm not doing in-person right. events anymore. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Um, so I just developed what was called Mailbox Book Club. Okay. Um, and at a Mailbox Book Club, my, my Mailbox Book Club is basically, you know, I write a book each month and people who are subscribed to, to the service, they get, they get that book for free every month. You, um, you say so, do a book every month. Like you're talking about, Oh, I get month. a haircut every month. You know, yeah, I'm like... yeah, that's, that's what it, that's what it, and, and, and these books aren't like these, aren't, they're not big, like, you know, um, uh, big volumes. They're kind of like, um, 15 to 20 poems per book. Um, and, and basically, you know, I, I publish those books you know, I send like, you know, reminders out to, to, to the, those who are already subscribed to that, that book is coming in the middle of the month. Uh, those who want to subscribe, you know, I give them my contact information, uh, and everything. Um, so I've, I've kind of got to this point where, you know, I can publish pretty quickly. I just got to make sure my editing and my proofing is sharp because like, you know, I have to do all this stuff myself. And, um, you do all of that yourself. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I've been doing it like the the writing, the formatting, the the graphics. You know, I do all of that. You know, myself, and and it's it's a labor of love. Yes, but I, but it I'm is. Efficient. I'm a, I'm efficient. I'm efficient with it. And when I first started, when I had the idea, I think it was like last year. Mm-hmm. Um, it started like early early this year, January. The first book came out early January, and then we're like, what is it August now? August now. We're like, yeah, we're about you know seven eight books in now. Um, Last year, last fall, I, I started doing a lot of pre-writing. I was testing myself, okay, how much can I write in a month? I write every day. I was gauging myself and measuring myself. So I went ahead and just started pre-writing. So I'm writing all these small volumes of books, small volumes of books for six months. I did that straight. Wow. And so I had, a lot of, I had a lot of material collected. So I separated all that material into smaller books. All right, so that way when January hit, I already have book one was ready. But I, but I had content for like book 10 already, you know, by, by the start of January. So oh. after that, it was all graphics. Okay. Taking pictures, making sure the graphics are right and fun and festive and people see it. Uh, and people enjoy it. And, and it keeps me, uh, connected to readers and it keeps me experimenting more with, with the poetry. You know, I feel like, you know, it's, it's the, the publishing pace and the writing pace are kind of synced. Okay. Okay, well, if someone is listening to you right now and they're like, man, who is that brother? I need him to help me because I'm the baddest spoken word <laughs> poet around and I know he can help me. And man, what do I need to do to hook up with him? What 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 do you say to that person listening? Yeah, they, they I mean, if they want to contact, contact me, they can definitely contact me. Um, I'm at um, the official website is IamGorilla.com. That's I am G U E. R R I L L A dot com. Um, that's like my the official website of my like my company, which is Girl Ignition. That focuses on the publishing uh, and the recording. And they can just send me a uh, message, you know, through the contact form, and I'll answer any any questions that they have. And you know, if they they need some help in a certain area of, of the publishing world and they want to get stuff out. I can definitely help with that as well. 
Do you think the events that have taken place in the last few years, the Breonna Taylors, the George Floyds, I was listening to you intently earlier, and you were saying how some poets and spoken word artists, you know, some poets keep things close to themselves. It's just for themselves. Do you think that those events have brought out some poets that maybe in the past would not have been as vocal as they are now because they see these injustices and they're like, no, I'm, I'm not just going to write about it for myself. I'm going to talk about this. Right. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because, like, a lot of poets, you know, they, they'll put their, their politi- political positions, you know, in inside of the poetry because poets have done it for a, a, an extremely long time. Um, and I think that, you know, the poetry, you know, if you're not into like writing speeches and you, you go to poetry events and you see how they're integrating what's happening, you know, with the American culture um, inside of their poems. They're talking about Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Tamir Rice. And they're seeing that like it can be done that way and it's connecting with people. It, that is, that's inspiring. That's inspiring for a lot of people. And so a lot of, I, I definitely think a lot of private poets over the, over these last like, you know, the, all these last dozen, dozens or so of injustice have stepped into the public poet space, right? Because they feel like they have something to say and they want to make sure they connect um, with with people. And a lot of times, you know, a speech might not work. You know, the poem might just work. You right. know, and right. I, I, <laughs> you know, it's just the way it's, that the artistic, you know, connection I believe um, is there. So. I definitely say yes. I think a lot of the private poets did step into the, the public poet realm and decide, you know, I want to get up and speak and be behind a microphone and, and talk to people because I think these important just can't, these these events simply can't just be swept under the rug like mm-hmm. it's just a normal, another another normal day in, in America, you know. Have you returned to in-person readings and performances? I know COVID is still out there. People are still yeah, being careful, but you're are you back out on the scene? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I've I've uh, I've stepped into I've test I've, I've been testing the the, the the waters the last several months. So yes, um, not full fledged, not full that's a full power right now. Um, I'm like sixty percent, you know, I'm about sixty percent there. And so we I've done events at um, Gallery U Quincy in in Norfolk. Big shout out to my, my man U Quincy out there. Um, he was the first one that kind of brought me back. He gave me the first big platform nice. you know, outside when COVID, when COVID, you know, once I said, okay, I want to start doing a, a, some stuff a little more, you know, get more back to the public. So he offered me that platform. So from there, I've been doing a lot of, um, a lot of libraries. I've been in Williamsburg a few times. Um, I was supposed to go, I was doing, I was supposed to be doing the Indie Soul Fest, which is in Springfield, Massachusetts. I was supposed to do that Saturday. Um, but I got delayed because my wife had like a medical medical thing, and as you know, in any soul fest, it's a it's an outside um, oh, kind of event. Oh, okay. Um, I was so I was looking forward to it, but honestly, inside these events, like say the, the the art space, you know, I still and I got people at home that are who are immunocompromised, um, and I've been I've been vaxxed, I've been boosted, you know, because that's one thing I don't want to worry about, you know, is is getting COVID to the point where it just it really just stops what I'm doing completely. Um, so. Um, Getting the vaccine for me had like a larger objective. I was like, I want to keep my people safe mm-hmm. because I'm in classrooms and then um, I'm around students. And then if I go into the public space doing readings, I want to make sure I'm as, as, as protected as, as, as possible. Um, so I still wear my mask when I go in, mm-hmm. um, wear my, my mask throughout. But when I'm performing, once I'm behind the mic or the podium, I'll take it off for that 30 minutes or so and then I'll put it right back on and, and go about my day. Um, but but yeah, I've been slowly getting back into the in-person performances, and um, actually, I was in Williamsburg not too long ago at a book book warehouse. The outlet mall is out there. Oh yeah, There's, uh, yeah, yeah. Event out there. Yeah, yeah. I've done, so I've been in, 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 in these spaces, and it's kind of um, it's kind of awkward, you know, trying to like, you know, you don't want to get sick, mm-hmm. but you want to perform. It's like it's a weird space to be in. And I was like, okay, do I do I check off? Did I check off all the boxes? Okay, I got my vaccine. Okay, if I get COVID, okay, because I'm around my mother a lot, and so my mother's immunocompromised, and and 
Um, she had a stroke years ago, and I don't want to exactly. bring anything into the exactly. home, right? <laughs> That's right. So when I go when, when I go see her, I'm masked up all the time. I never take my mask off Seneca? in my parents' house at all. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, we have run out of time. Believe it or not, we have oh, okay. a good time, <laughs> but we have <laughs> ten seconds for you to give out your social media handle again, please. Uh, social media handle, you can find me on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Seneca, Instagram, I am Seneca, I am underscore, uh, I am underscore Seneca uh, on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter or anything like that. I can't get rid of Twitter. Twitter wasn't, wasn't working for me, but <laughs> thank you. that's where you can find me at. <laughs> thank you so much, Seneca Lofton. He's a poet, he's an author, he's an educator. Thank you for joining us on the line today with Cheryl Wilkerson. Thank you all for listening. We'll do it again next week. Take care. Be safe. We love you. Bye-bye.